Uh, we currently have a consortium of 18 institutions, which uh, we use the expertise of faculty members in different disciplines to address all the transportation issues that we currently face in our region. Um, UCRT has been administering the September 11th Memorial Program for the past well, since the inception of the program, 2005, and at, um, since then we've had 39 students participate in the program. And I would like to thank our year 11, once again, um, to our recipients, Bahama Mohini and Patricia Acuna, for their involvement this year. And I personally know them because they are part of um, UTRD as well, and the college, and I'm there. And, um, I know that they've worked really diligently throughout this year and have been very dedicated to their respective assignments. I would also like to thank their supervisors, Ali Mouseni and uh, oh, sorry, Susan McSherry. And uh, I would like to also give a special thanks to Jose, Jerry, and Say2 for the project management of the program. And just a brief introduction, once again, for you guys. Bauman is a PhD candidate at the Grove School of Engineering at the City College of New York. He performed his internship in collaboration with NIMSIC staff on the topic of transit signal priority projects. He has studied the impact of transit signal priority on speed, travel time, congestion, delay, and air quality, and possible reliability of public transit in the New York metropolitan region. Patricio, also a PhD candidate at the Grove School of Engineering at the City College of New York, intern at the New York City DOT. His topic was automatic vehicle locators, data mining and visualization and dashboard, dashboard functionality. The research involved the scoping and requirements gathering for an automatic vehicle location data dashboard that will support the analysis and evaluation of the DOT Hunts Point Clean Truck Program, as well as other DOT programming relying on the analysis of GPS breadcrumb data from commercial trucks, for hire vehicles, fleet vehicles, and private automobiles. Um, we will now start with our presentation, but each supervisor is going to come up with their um, intern. So we will start now with Ali Monseni and Salman Mohini. Thank you. Oh, okay, one more thing. I'm so sorry. Can you please reserve your questions and comments to the end of both presentations? Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. My name is Ali Mosseni, and I'm in tech staff. Uh, I had the pleasure working with uh, Mr. Bahman Mohini uh, as an intern for 9 11 uh, Memorial Program on a uh, TSP project. And the purpose of this project was to do research and perform pilot tests on the impact of transit signal priority on the speed, travel time, congestion, and delay, and subsequently air quality in New York metro area. Uh, regarding the outline of the work, uh, and as part of first step, which was literature review, uh, first we needed to know about the uh, CSP projects that have been already implemented in this uh, region. And uh, at the beginning, we had some difficulty to do the data collection, but uh, finally, with the help of New York uh, uh, City DOT, uh, specifically Mr. Ernest uh, Atanaides, the director of signal and ITS at uh, New York City DOT, and also Mr. Imad uh, Makarius. Uh, we could uh, collect a lot of good data for uh, doing this project, and I really appreciate their help and cooperation. And now, uh, Bahman is going to start his presentation. Thank you. Thank you, everybody, for coming to this presentation. My name is Bahman Mourini. Uh, doing presentation about time signal priority uh, and its effect on traffic congestion and air quality. How this transit is affected by uh, intersection signal which can cause a vicious cycle of congestion. For example, considering bus, if it is stopped again and again behind the signal light, a lot of people like you and I won't consider bus 
as an interactive mode of transportation, and, and then we are using our private car in order to go from our origin to the destination. So this feeding of this official cycle, not making the transit an attractive mode of transit. Transit priority is a potential strategy uh, to improve uh, public transportation performance through uh, scheduling reliability and reducing delay at intersection. It's also benefiting uh, public transportation by reducing operating costs, lower passenger delay, improve reliability and environmental impact. In a very brief brief, I want to talk about uh, transit priority. So this is the bus coming from uh, approaching the signal and intersection, and as it is approaching the signals, we are sending this bus, sending information to this uh, signal controlling system. This communication can be through wireless communication or sending through mobile or optical detector, or there are a lot of techniques uh, right now with uh, the rise of uh, connected vehicle and smart cities. This communication is happening using DSRC or other these techniques. But the big picture is as the bus is approaching, they send a signal about its, its position, and the signal um, getting this information and try to send that information to the signal controller in order to change the logic of the signal as the bus is getting closer and closer so that it can facilitate the movement of the bus. Some people said the priority is now. The decision maker is saying because the bus is not doing a, doing a good job, we should make metro. But we know it's having a lot of, uh, needs a lot of budget. Other people said we shouldn't do anything because it is what it is. But we know the traffic light is up to 30% of the travel time uh, of the bus related to signals. So in between building metro or doing nothing, a wise approach is to do priority. Priority can be done through two ways. Priority in space, you provide a dedicated lane for the bus to get through, or in time, we call it transit signal priority. So in order to bring down the main running time and, and other uh, parameter of interest. Some people say it is a high, it's not a health, but it's been proven by many scholars all over uh, the 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 world specifically in European cities, which are the pioneer in applying transit signal priority, that TSP is really helping the performance of the bus and transit system. The first city in New York was Portland, Oregon. Uh, I think was eight years ago through TriMet uh, applied to one of its corridor and bring down the travel time of the bus from. You know, 11% saving one buses, not mentioning about the, the improvement of uh, system, bring down the travel time and delay and everything. So it's not a high, it's really helping. This is the, um, this is the model done in Europe, in Netherlands. Uh, this is um, the bus, different stop, and this is the punctuality of the bus is stopping at this signal. It is coming late or early. So the one on the left, without TSP, you have the deviation of the scheduling of the bus approaching to each stop. And providing these uh, TSP, see how it is sticking or adhering to, to this schedule, improving the reliability of the bus movement. A very simple calculation uh, of the number of buses needed for every route. Considering the bus coming from origin to destination and getting back. So this is the number of bus needed is the cycle time of the bus coming from origin to destination divided by headway. Headway mostly coming is, is a policy uh, parameter saying every 20 minutes you need a bus. So this cycle time is the running time from A to B plus B to A plus some layover. It, it's kind of 80 factor of the bus needed to be applied depending on the reliability of the travel time, the distribution of the travel time of the bus. And like I showed in the previous slide, providing transit signal priority, improving this reliability, and reducing the span between 95 percentile to the mean, and improving this, reducing this lower 
time. So again, the TSP brings down stop running time, the old, and, and also a lower layover time, which in a sense, improving the systems, takes more buses, and bringing down the delay for, for, for buses. There are a lot of techniques used, of practices used for TSP, I just want to mention very briefly. Green extension of the bus, approaching the bus to provide the green so that the bus can get through. Uh, early green, if the bus uh, comes on in uh, red time, we are trying to take the green for other phases, phase rotation if you have a left turn, we change the sequence of the signaling, and there are a lot of new techniques coming up for providing the CSP. New York City OT on the route using these uh, most well known practices in extension and early degree. I don't want to mention about active priority and active priority. Ten years ago, we do priority when there is a bus coming to the intersection. But right now, we are saying it should be more intelligent with the rise of you know, intelligent transportation systems and communication. If there is a passenger in a bus, it's providing this priority. If the congestion is low, if there is no queue spill back and other we applied, we, we run the model in micro simulation uh, listing in order to provide, to see the impact of the TSP over the signal with different levels of demand. Without, we applying different practices with no TSP, then adding one strategy, combining different practices, and, uh, and then adding more. Is if, with this level of demand, how it's reduced by applying different practices not only for just lower demand, but also for medium and high demand, TSP is doing a good job. We also model this in, on a corridor to see the impact of the TSP on a corridor. We applying the TSP uh, bring down the bus delay significantly and not changing much the overall um, delay for, for the vehicles. New York City DOT has started applying these transit signal priority in its routes. I think it started in 2012, I guess. These, nah, these blue circles are the projects they have performed so far. These uh, red circle projects are the ones that are working right now, and those yellow are the ones that they're going to implement in the future, but their goal is to apply TSP on many routes, on, on many bus routes, because it's been given the good result for, for their system. So the logic they use as the bus approaches the signal, the sending information to 4G to the, uh, with the help of New York City Transit and coordinating with New York City controlling system and, and uh, providing the position of the bus and changing the logic of the signal as the bus is approaching, they change the logic and providing green bay for, for, for the bus. So they are finding Lauren and Hatton M15 and the result shows that providing priority, transit priority, bring down the travel time for the bus and northbound 9%, southbound 11%, average speed improving 10% to 7% just in lower Manhattan, M50. So, and also they applied on other corridors, different boroughs, Bester Avenue, Northern Avenue, and Highland Boulevard. You see during AM and PM, the improvement of the transit running time, improvement in the speed was about 10 to 20 percent depends on which, which corridor and which borough. Uh, and but the, but the bottom line is they did a good job and they, they, the results have shown that they're, they're doing a good job in providing TSP in the system. So again, by New York City DOT, it, so, it shows that 21 percent of the travel time of the bus regarding to the signals. If we provide this platform to the signal so that we can bring down the delay for passenger. But it is mentioned in literature up to 30 percent 
in other cities can be related to, to the flight of trans. Thus far, I, I said that NIST transit signal priority has been proven in many cities. We showed that uh, through an isolated intersection with a corridor, it's been doing a good job. New City OT did a good job. Right now, we are applying this logic to the NYBCM to see how it will impact a lot of people may shift from automobile to using a bus because if we're providing the TSP for a bus, bus at the most would be more attractive mode of transit. So that's the somehow the goal with this. NYBTM, this is a trans route in New York metro area. This is NYBTM, the structure of the NYBTM, the simulation software using by NIMTEC to, to, to capture the model, the movement in, in metro area. So the representation of applying TSP to NIMTEC would be changing the image of travel time of bus of some route and then running the NIMTEC and then see the result through CMP and post-processing air quality in order to see if such impact was good or not. This is the, the way we apply. This is, we show Staten Island, because Staten Island is the borough that bus as a mode of transportation is more pronounced, it's more noticeable as compared to other boroughs, which, you know, metro is more uh, noticeable. This is the point, just changing the bus image of travel time in, in uh, NYBCM just only for Highland Boulevard, let's say bringing down the travel time for 20%, how it will impact on congestion management. <laughs> Applying such model, uh, doing the result before or after the study, the VMT vehicle mod and DHT has improved a little bit. Uh, the average daily was changed for about 0.3%, and the VHT reduced for less than 1%, and then we are fine not only from one route, but for all bus routes in Staten Island, and running again the simulation comparing to the base to see such impact. Again, applying the uh, NYBTM, the VMT and VHT has shown the average daily reduction in VMT and VHT was better as compared to before, but uh, it is 0.8% reduction. We applied previously was 2010, and now we are applying in 2017 the most updated version of NYDPM. Again, VMT and VHD in speed has improved for about 1%. We applied the air quality, TPS air quality, to see the, the the air quality and energy of, of, of the system before and after TSP, again, is improved, but wasn't much significant was using the NYUPM. The conclusion is TSP, through a lot of researchers, through our simulation and everything, has been proven that doing a good job on an isolated intersection, on a corridor, it's bringing out the travel time. It should be implemented on many routes in New York metro area. It is a good strategy to make the public transit more attractive, should be encouraged. Using the NYVPM uh, to see if such impact uh, can change some people shifting from auto to the bus, the apply, it was a good result. It improved, but it wasn't much significant. It wasn't noticeable uh, from our point of view, part of the reason should be the NYBTM focus is the first is the regional model, not for fresh borrows. The second thing is that NYBTM is mostly prioritized doing priority on auto and then rail and then bus. So this is maybe part of the reason that the NYBTM doesn't much well capturing the changing in the attributes of buses. So the impact of NYVPM, the sensitivity of NYVPM as compared regarding the attributes of bus need to be reconsidered in the new update of NYVPM in a future outbreak. 
And again, for as a recommendation, it's better to using the distribution of the travel time. I know it's, it, it's you know, it's causing a lot of uh, performance time, but still, uh, it should be done. Uh, at the end, I want to thank everybody for joining, especially I want to thank my supervisor, Ali Mosseni, for providing all this guidance and help along the way. I really appreciate your help, Ali. I will thank uh, Ali Afshar for his help, also Sandy for his technical help, and also all members, uh, staff of uh, technical group of NITEC, which provided me all these information and kind uh, environment. I really enjoyed uh, working with you and learned a lot. Thank you.
and set up the eligibility criteria so that, <coughs> excuse me, we were concentrating on heavy duty vehicles in class three through eight, that uh, those applicants needed to prove at, that they were accessing Hunts Point and Park Morris area, or that you know, they had a history of access, uh, and that they worked in, in that community. They either lived there uh, with, a, with a, an address there, or they came from outside on a very regular basis. Um, we would only retire, uh, well, we would, try, would retire engines and trucks for 2006 model years or older because the 2007 EPA standard uh, had the PM reduction. Um, the, however, the 2010 standard also has a NOx reduction. So by the time we actually got the, the uh, project off the ground, we were already in that model year of 2010. So we, we were able to accelerate to the, to, to the newest and the latest model year of engine. We kept the, the 2007 because we also offered diesel retrofits. So you didn't necessarily have to strap your truck, but, but if you wanted to do a, a, a diesel particulate filter and keep your old truck, we would do that also, and you needed a you know, certain model year age requirements for those DTFs to work. Um, and finally, we required that the, that the applicants prove to us that they were a Hunts Point fleet and that they visited the area at least two times a week. Uh, we didn't want to impact business operations uh, that um, dramatically, but we did want to see that the trucks were being used in the South Bronx. And that, and that they would stay in the, in the general area. So um, we worked with Federal Highway. We had a very, very tight geofence at first uh, using the, the, the NIMSIC geofence. But we found that, in fact, Hunts Point is the huge regional market. They go all over the place. And so we needed to sort of widen that out. Uh, so the geofence, uh, is now the entire uh, chart data area because <clears throat> as far as Federal Highway is concerned, that's still uh, you know, uh, good for them. Uh, and finally, also, we, in order with the quid pro quo, in order to get the rebate funding, we required that the ADL be installed so that we could monitor remotely. A lot of these programs originally, um, some of the earlier versions uh, allowed for um, the applicants to, to send in uh, information and reporting requirements uh, in writing, but we found that that didn't really work best. And with a 500 truck complement, that would have been uh, a lot to try to organize. So the ADL um, has been working out very well. We've been able to really understand um, how the trucks behave in in Hunts Point and uh, been able to look at local versus regional impacts. This is a time of day. This is some older sort of information. This is for uh, a day in the life of the Hunt Point Truck Program on June 2nd, 2015. And the yellow, uh, red, and the blue um, represent the shifts. Uh, so the yellow would be midnight to about 8 a.m then red is 8 to 4, blue is 4 to midnight. And so we were able to really see and understand just how much um, activity was happening, when it was happening, the impact on, uh, on the South Bronx and, and the surrounding area. This is another sample that, uh, that Patricio, um, when he starts to look at the data, um, started to break out into um, um, increments of uh, 15 minutes, um, you know, trying to work on the visualization piece of it. Um, the ADL has proven to us that we have 97% uh, compliance with the trucks meeting our eligibility uh, rules. Um, on the left in the red is our sort of home-based geofence uh, because of the uh, re repetitive nature of the ADL pings of every two minutes. Um, we we couldn't just geofence on Point Port Mars. It really didn't make any sense. So we did from uh, the GW Bridge South. Um, again, this is sort of a, a, a zoom in view of um, and the truck's behavior, their, their adherence to the truck route, uh, their activities within the geofence, and uh, the, um, the five girls that large foot in particular in Manhattan. 
Um, so very quickly, we we spent many years and a lot of money. We have we have gotten the 500 trucks on on the road and using the diesel emission quantifier, we're able to uh, predict the annual emission reductions by um, you know several several tons in every category, um, which uh, is a great thing for for the neighborhoods and the community of the South Bronx and the city as a whole. Um, but we, we weren't really able to uh, take that ADL data that we were receiving from Network Fleet. It would come as a canned report that the prime uh, contractors consultant would provide. We wanted to be able to take that information and, and make it more useful, not just to find out whether it was just compliance and they were within the rope, but that uh, we could use that information for um, to inform other other um, projects at DOT, our freight program, uh, and um, and you know learn different uh, behaviors uh, aside from. Oops, I just did. Okay, here we go. Yeah. So uh, the 9/11 program uh, was uh, presented to us as a possibility for getting additional help and support uh, in that effort. Um, we, what we'd like to do was create more visualization tools that we could bring out to the uh, to the public, and um, you know use that ADL uh, GPS breadcrumb data, develop a, a visualization tool, and um, you know allow allow it to be simplified in such a way that um, DOT employees from various backgrounds, whether they are from the the Borough Commissioner's office, they could take this. Uh, the tool and use it at the community board uh, meetings or you know for various other stakeholders and audiences. Um, our request on that project uh, scope was to ask uh, the candidates to provide a scoping and design requirements of what it would take for us to create this dashboard and uh, take that ADL data that was coming in as a CSV file, automate it. Um, Animate it so that we could, um, at any particular given you know space and time, understand how the trucks were operating. And this would be in support of the on point program, our other programs and studies, and for public outreach. Uh, we also were thinking it might be able to help us see social and economic trends and environmental impacts of truck operations uh, outside of uh, Hunts Point and other areas as well inform the truck route compliance and, and uh, safety studies and um, make it easy and, and easy to use uh, uh, tool. Um, so with that, I'm going to hand it over to Patricio, who uh, we were lucky enough to have answer our call for help through the program uh, to, to provide some of the discussion about the methodology and the results. Thank you. Good morning. Um, I'm going to explain um, the study methodology. Okay, um, from the beginning of this uh, project, uh, I thought how to create a general perspective of this project. So, um, at the beginning, I received uh, Hundred of CSP files, um, one file per day. So we decided to create uh, an a procedure to integrate all these files into one database. So this is this procedure is SQL Server Integration Service (SSIS). It's a service that belongs to SQL Server from Microsoft. So after doing that. In the, uh, after doing the integration of this data set, uh, we look for another data set, for instance, taxi data, weight motion, bicycles, death heading, buses, um, different data sets, since we have uh, the integration service. After having that, um, we create an OLTP database. The OLTP database is a transactional database. What's the meaning of this? Since I upload all my data from the CSV files, I can modify my data in this database. 
After doing that, I create an EGL, an extraction, transformation, and load. So this process led us to estimate, for instance, travel time, distance, um, different uh, kind of fields that we don't have it, but we need to create since we have the data set. Okay, so again, we need to create an integration service and an analysis service. This analysis service will let us, will let us create a multidimensional model and a tabular model. The multidimensional model um, has, uh, is when you have a uh, database bigger than one giga, one terabyte. But if you have a data set lower than one terabyte, we can use a tabular model. After doing this, we can create an lab cube. The lab cube will let us connect with Power BI, R, RGS, SQL Server, different uh, software, different kind of software. So basically here, you can see the pipeline of this project. Um, Right now, this architecture is developed in the City College server. Um, it's in the environment of Windows Server, and we are using SQL Server. And for this project, we use Power BI. Power BI is a state of the art in data visualization. Okay. Um, we receive uh, hundreds of CSV files, and we try to analyze uh, the content of this data. So each file has the latitude and longitude. And the latitude and the longitude, the combination of them, is called a pin. So, and the pin is every two minutes. So we decide uh, to do an analysis about these things. For instance, when one truck departs from point A to point B, if the travel time is one hour, the number of pins will be 30. So we will have 30 pins. But the question is, what is the distance between each pin? What's the distance? So uh, we were looking for the distance between zero to one mile, one to two miles, until greater than 11 miles. So we analyzed 45 million records, and we found that 85% of these records are between zero and one mile, 85% of these data sets. Okay, after finding that, uh, we split inside between one mile, between one mile, from zero to 0.25 miles, from 25 miles to 0.5 miles, until one mile, and we found that 61% of the data is inside between zero and 0.25 miles, each pin. So it's the distance between uh, two points, okay? So um, after understanding this data, uh, we decide to go to another step um, to create a visualization. And we found this, um, we analyzed this uh, variable, the BMT, the vehicle mile travel. And since we have data since 2013 until 2016, and we plot this data, we estimate the BMT for each uh, month and trying to understand uh, the seasonal uh, variation of this data. So if you see here in summer, uh, July, August, and September have the highest peak of BMT vari variation, have the highest, okay? After we did an analysis by Borough, um, since we have the data, we took the sample day. September 7th, and we create, we did a geospatial data analysis. 
The geospatial data analysis considers the five boroughs. And why we highlight this, why we, we select this number, this day? We select because it has the highest BMT of the year. That's why we select September 7. After doing that, we found the following things. Browns had the highest BMT, followed by Queens, then Manhattan, Brooklyn, and Staten Island. And basically here, 45% of the BMT generates is inside the Bronx. In the Bronx. Um, but the other ones are lower than 20, 23. If you see, Staten Island is 1%. And it makes sense because Hans Point is in the Bronx. So we are in the right track with this data analysis. After doing that, we decide to do an analysis by census track. Okay. So we did the census track by borough. So we found that for the same day, for the same sample day, and we found that Hans Point had 30% of the PMT generate, uh, followed by Mount Haven for Maurice, 25%. So if you see here, uh, we have the zones that can be studied in the future. Okay, this is for just for the Browns uh, by census track, only in one day, okay? And here we plot the, the pins inside a map and we can see, this is the Bronx area, and we can see how the pins match with the expressway, Bruckner Street, Cross Bronx Expressway. So, and in this area, we have around half a million people living in that area. Okay, this one is Brooklyn by census track, again, for the sample day. And the total BMT is here. 1,500, and um, it's Williamsburg has 13%, followed by Carl Gardens, Columbia Street, 12%, okay? Um, the census tract has 277 uh, blocks, but right now the blocks of the others have 59%. They have uh, a distribution lower than 5%. So that's why we didn't consider that. We show only the highest uh, census tract uh, BMT distribution. Okay, again, this is uh, here. This is a geofence for the fast lane project. Uh, we plot here all the truck, all the ridership from the trucks, and if you see here. This is the BQE. Uh, we have in, the, in this area, we have Long Island City, uh, Brooklyn, and the Maspeth area. So if you see here, we have uh, an average, all, all the Mondays from 2015 for each month. So we have, for instance, uh, right now September, we have 154 trucks in this area. Working. And the total BMT is 628. Okay, for Manhattan, the same thing. So Central Park generates 9% of the BMT distribution uh, from this program. And I double check if I do something wrong, but it's okay. That's the pattern. Okay, for Queens, the same thing. Uh, Forest Park, Highland Park has the 14, have 14.98%. And the Southern Island, uh, New Spring, Bloomfield, 14%, followed by Gatsmer, 9.7%, and Marine Harbors. Okay, so all these outputs are generally after doing a geospatial data analysis. Okay, I'm gonna show a visualization. Okay, 
here. This is uh, September 7, 2016. And here we have the, the pins. And that day we're working 375 trucks. And, and here I have the number of trucks that were working here in the in that day by hour. For instance, at 4 a.m. we're working 132 trucks. At 9 a.m. we're working 320 trucks. And the average speed is shown here <coughs> at that time. And this is the number of pins of that day. Uh, we're talking about 73,000 pins. And here, this is a, a, a trip map that shows the pin number. For instance, this truck generates 639 pins. Okay. And here we have the average speed of these trucks. And here we have um, the number of trucks by time of day. Uh, for instance, if I would like to analyze 9 a.m., I would select here 9 a.m. We will change the map to dynamic. Okay, so 9 a.m., um, we have 320 trucks working, and we generate in that hour 5,644 pins. And if you see here, in the trip map, uh, this truck generates 31 pins. So basically, this truck with this pin number were working around one hour. So if I would like to analyze if the ignition was off of the truck, I can click here, okay? Uh, I can see it here. Okay. If you see the pins, the ignition of the trucks uh, were off. So it means that these trucks were doing a delivery or or something else. Um, that's the pattern 9 a.m. I can change, for instance, for 10 a.m. The same thing. And here. This is here, this area. I can go to house point two. here and the trucks are stopped here in this point. That's the visualization is on the web and we use Power BI to develop to develop this uh, project. So 
um, the challenges of these, uh, one of them was to anonymize the data set because, uh, you know, each truck belongs to one vendor, and belongs to one client, and we need to be cautious not showing the names. So uh, we create uh, an application in EOS to anonymize this data set. Um, in parallel, we have uh, in this project uh, a limited, limited tools, uh, SQL Server, Power BI, and basically we use the resources from City College. Um, thank you. I would like to say thank you to Susan Mashari um, and the team of Play Mobility. I'm, I'm charged. Thank you, Patricio. Thank you, Lama. If you could please come back up. We now have the floor open for questions or comments. So, Jerry. So, Bauman, um, was were you able to measure any changes in the transit ridership? based on the fact that the TSP was improving the service. Mm -hmm. right. Right. So when you were looking at the, the differences in BMT and BHT, right. was the BPM able to account for changes in ridership on the route? Uh, I didn't find that. I think it would be the outcome of the model. So I don't know. I need to look at the result to find the ridership change in, in, the, in the BMT and BHT. That's a good question. But, Indicator. Right. Thank you. Question for Patricia. You mentioned that the, you mentioned about the uh, things mostly based on one mile, one 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 mile, and then you broke it down to point two. So does it mean that the trucks, the maximum number of trucks, are having to speed up? The, Seven miles per hour in the area. That's correct. Yes, we can estimate the speed. Um, basically, we will have that that number. Um, it's not it's not a reasonable uh, speed because um, they need to improve. And they need to move some deliveries, and at that speed, you will be under the traffic congestion seven miles per hour. Uh, I have a question for you. Uh, yeah, back for the observation, I think there's beautiful, you know, uh, map and everything's really great. Thank you. But one thing I was wondering that I think it was page screen one because I was, was looking at the number of trucks for Queens and Manhattan, but three and D is very like similar. So. I, I, I'm not really sure, like, out of that, what per job the BT might totally different. So, what you, what, what are you going to try to get out of that, like, number? You know, per job the BT is totally different. But then, that finding, what do you want to say with that finding? Okay. Um, the question is, why I use the BMT? Yeah, I mean, what's the BMT really tell? If you're looking at the number of the fall, you know, that the, of course the uh, wrong has, you know, higher number, and the second is the queen, and third is the, uh, the Manhattan, but I think that, can you just show me the page 21? I think it's better to explain with the page 21. Yeah, here, like, if you're looking at the queens, they have 165 truck, and B and B is 2,900, and Manhattan is 23, and the B and B is 23. Right. So, what the B and T in this table tells, and how the system relates to truck, and out of this number, what do you really want to say? Yeah. Okay, basically, the B and T will let us know the, how they are operating, the ridership that they are doing in these uh, boroughs. Um, we can associate this B and T with other variables like measuring the air quality. So in this case, it's going to help. But in part of it, we can uh, uh, evaluate some corridors for pacing deterioration. 
So the EMT is a very good reference to uh, for this kind of analysis. That's why we use this number. In other hand, uh, the number of trucks that is not the same for each photo because the activity for each photo is different. Um, but that's why we use these variables. Right. I really like both the presentation. Both of them are very exceptional. And thank you for that. First with the woman. Uh, the TSP, which uh, uh, Jerry Bowers requested uh, a few minutes earlier, uh, it is not implemented into the NYPK model. So as a result, it is very hard to distinguish the impact of how GSP will affect our NYPK model because it is the regional model. So it is, it is not included there. The other one, ABL, the one you refer, for example, uh, in this borough bronze to the PMG. The trucks are producing a lot of uh, PM, particular measures, and that is really affecting New York City's children because that's, that's the asthma which, which is getting the main impact on, on PM. So the PMG correlated with your PM, PM was really a significant one. That's how you can you can get all the pollutants as far as the VOC, NOx, PM 2.5, and PM 10. All the information you can get from there, and that's a very significant development. And it's it's, it's really very useful. We can, though we are analyze, analyzing our uh, uh, pollutants using the MOVES model, motor vehicle emission simulation model. But this one is a step where you can analyze those things separately. And thank you for that one. Those. Thank you. Any more questions, comments? No? Okay. So we are concluding. And uh, we have concluded. And uh, thank you, guys. All the best.